Welcome to Theo Trade. This is Don Kaufman. It's August 19th, 2019, and you are watching the Theo Trade evening video. With about 30 minutes left in today's cash session, the S&Ps right now are up kind of a, again, staggering 35 handles. I say a staggering 35 handles because uh, once again, the name of the game right now, it's all about large ranges on a day-to-day -day basis. But there's one very specific standout that I kind of want to highlight here before we go any further. And that has everything to do with lack of liquidity inside of today's trading session. One of the reasons I wanted to actually record this session still with some time left in the clock is to detail, again, how evident this really happens to be. So right here, right now on the trading day, we've done, oh, just over a million S&P futures contracts, all right? Push that aside for just a second because in the pre-market, this is just before the cash bell went off, okay? We already had 320,000 contracts. I mean, roughly speaking, uh, that really only leaves us, okay, in the neighborhood right now of about 700,000 contracts that have effectively traded during cash market hours, which people, again, it is just unbelievably light in terms of liquidity out there. Even for, you know, August, it's, it's you know, it's summer and people, again, they kind of put excuses out there. Nevertheless, in the last couple of trading days, since we've actually kicked off some of these larger ranges, I mean, come on, we've had, you know, two and a half million contracts, two million contracts. I mean, one and a half million has been kind of, you know, at least the bare minimum today. Ooh, we're going to be lucky to sputter, okay, into like the 1.3, 1.4 million contracts. Again, liquidity inside of the equity markets, it is non-existent. I wanted to show you Amazon out there again. Equity markets, liquidity is non-existent. I'll show you kind of a wider spectrum. Take a look at something like Caterpillar. Caterpillar isn't even doing but like half of its normal volume on any given trading day, okay? There's, again, for summer trade, this isn't light. For summer trade, it's non-existent. And yet, again, we're having these larger, you know, what, 35, 36 handle ranges in terms of the S&Ps. But for today's evening video, push all of it aside because in this evening video we're going to do something a little bit different you know we've talked extensively about the xlf in a lot of the re recent videos and something i talk about extensively on theo trade on a day-to-day -day basis and the financials are kind of firmly in control one of the things that i want to point out about the xlf today is that it's lagging again lagging on a percentage basis versus the s p's so again in a big up day it's well the financials are a little bit of a drag okay which is surprising seeing how the bonds are effectively backing off not to a massive degree the zb's down what 0.10 ticks the zn's down about a half a point but again the xlf holding its own here up just about 1%. So why am I bringing the financials back into focus? Well, one of the reasons that I've had a very okay, bearish outlook on these financials has a tremendous amount to do okay, with some of the European financials. Now, for those of you that don't necessarily track Europe, some of the European stocks, that's all right. I'm just gonna give you a quick perspective over here. European banks in crisis. European banks are at 20 year lows. Take a look at some of them for yourself. And I wanted to list a few of the symbols. So even if I'm going a little bit too fast over here, that you still have this list where you can kind of freeze the video. It's UBS, RBS, ING, Deutsche Bank, ooh, little Barclays, Credit Suisse, all right, you know, some HSBC. But let me actually throw this, okay, into a few charts. To give you a feel for what we're looking at, again, in what is now, uh, I'm terming, uh, a full-blown European banking crisis. So I've gone ahead and brought up a grid. Now, granted, I realize that you can't see very much in this grid, but a, a quick comparison. Let's bring up the uh, the maximum chart for the XLF. Again, the maximum chart for the XLF. We're also going to cruise over here, and we're going to just call maximize the grid cell. Now, maximizing the grid cell, what is it allowing me to do? Now I can see everything. 
Okay. For the most part, where we looking all the way back to the time frame of uh, of 1999. That's about all I can fit in here to uh, to the present. If you had invested the entire time, well, you started at about 18, 19 bucks, and it's somewhere around like 26 and change over here. It's not exactly like blistering to the upside, but again, kind of how does that compare to some of the European banks? Right. And I'm going to give you some reasons of why you want to pay attention to this momentarily. So let's start to uh, kind of chip through our grid. This is uh, UBS. OK, uh, one of the primary Swiss banks over here. UBS. What are we looking at right now? Not going to not good, not good at all. You have to recognize where this underlying is currently trading, which is uh, 1048. We're starting to get down into the worst depths, if you will. This is the financial crisis. I mean, we're talking like late 08, early 2009. That's the financial crisis, but it's not just UBS. Let's have a quick look at Royal Bank of Scotland. Okay, Royal Bank of Scotland effectively trading right here, right now, $4.51. Depths of the financial crisis took us all the way down to $2. Still plenty of room for improvement to the downside there. Continuing on, ING, a $9 stock now. Okay, Deutsche Bank. Now, Deutsche Bank, listen, everybody knows the issues at Deutsche Bank. Okay, but the issues at Deutsche Bank could become systemic, if you will. They could spread, okay, to every bank inside of Europe and the entire world. Maybe come back to that idea a little bit later there. But Deutsche Bank, some of the problems are well known. Okay, Barclays. I think everybody's familiar with Barclays. In this particular circumstance, here we are, $6.80 stock. Again, right to the depths of the financial crisis. You know, if you were to just push aside some of the financial crisis, you're literally back to lows not seen, okay, since the mid-90s in this particular circumstance, okay? Then we come to Credit Suisse. Credit Suisse is now an $11 product. Again, an $11 product, the lowest point effectively that we've really seen for any sustained period of time, okay? Now, Continuing on, here we actually have Commerce Bank, another German bank, also hitting okay, fresh lows. And last but not least on the list, HSBC, all right, which is, again, down to being a $36 stock. Once again, not too far from the lows seen in the financial crisis. And back to our own XLF here. Now, the reason that I am bringing this to your attention all right, go ahead and minimize that. Again, our XLF is to get you to recognize, okay, first of all, some of the reasoning behind why European banks are at those lows. Obviously, interest rates has a tremendous amount to do with that. Now, we're not here to proclaim that rates in the U.S. are, are going zero or even going negative, okay? But rates right now are absolutely collapsing. And if this continues, okay, we believe that the same will hold true for many of your U.S. banks. I mean, if you look at any of the European banks, they're getting squeezed on the lending front, okay? They're getting squeezed on every aspect yield curve. It's just not there. Where do you achieve degrees of profitability, okay? When the edge is taken away from you, or effectively, again, you look at some of the German banks, they have to deal with negative interest rate policy. Now you have just over anywhere between 25 and 30% of the world's debt has now gone negative. What kind of holds true for the future of some of the U.S. financial firms? And I think that Europe is a fairly good place to start to look at just that. This doesn't mean, okay, full-fledged collapse necessarily of U.S. financial firms, but it absolutely does mean continued pressure into products like Goldman Sachs, which start to bring up, you know, maximum charts here, even in Goldman Sachs. This is not exactly stellar upside potential. Bring up things like, again, you know, the staples in here, you know, Bank of America, which hasn't necessarily recovered anywhere near where it was, you know, pre-financial crisis, okay? Or, for example, J.P. Morgan, which is the top kind of performer of some of the large stocks, okay? This is why I look at risk-reward, okay? And J.P. Morgan could be one of the most opportunistic on the short 
side again on the short side in years to come now i do not in any way shape or form want you to think that this is going to be a trade that's going to happen overnight it's going to take some time to develop nevertheless low rates coupled with european banks at like 20 year lows better believe that is going to be putting some pressure into the financials here in the u.s thanks everybody for joining us here at theo trade have a wonderful evening bye-bye